Dave. No. <laughs> Three guys who were talking in a pub, and they were all talking about, uh, the two of them were talking about the amount of control that they have over their wives. And the third one was remaining quiet. And after a while, the, the two realized that the third guy wasn't talking, so they turned around to the third guy, and they said, well, well, what about you? What kind of control do you have over your life? He goes, well, the other night, my wife, my wife came crawling to me on her hands and knees. And they said, really? And he said, yeah. And she said, get out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. We've talked a lot about strategies over the last uh, seven, uh, well, this is the seventh message, over the last six messages. We've talked about a lot of strategies when it comes to not fighting the battle, but winning the battle. Many times we fight the battles that come at us. And the Word of God says that we are eternally victorious. So we shouldn't fight the battles that come at us. We need to say, Lord, what is your strategy for winning the battle that has come toward me? Because I am eternally victorious in you. And so today is probably the simplest and yet the most difficult strategy of all. And it's the strategy of letting go of our need for control and standing still. So Neil and I, we got married in 2004, and after a couple of years of marriage, we thought we want to have kids. So we, like most couples, we, we knew what we needed to do in order for that to happen, and, and we began trying to have children, and we found out quickly that something wasn't working. You know, after, after a month goes by and you're not pregnant, not a big deal, that happens to a lot of people, after eight years went by, we were concerned. And throughout that time, during that eight years, we had different tests that were done and tried to figure out what exactly was, was causing this. We had no idea why we were unable to have children, but we weren't. And one doctor would send us off to get some tests done and come back and they'd say, we don't have an answer. We don't know why you're unable to have kids. And then this was hard because for me, I knew that I was called to have kids. I knew that God had promised me children. When I was 12 years old, I had a dream of my boy, and his name was Asher. And so from the time that I was 12 years old, I knew that God was going to give me a son, and his name was Asher. And then I had to start praying for a wife who liked the name Asher. <laughs> and so I knew that God was going to give us children, but I didn't know what it was that was causing the holdup. And it was hard. It was a struggle for both of us. Tanil, as a youth pastor, she would see young ladies who would get pregnant and not want their kids. And that was hurtful. I, as a father, I'd be looking around at all these dads that are raising up young men. And I'm going, Lord, come on. I'm not getting any younger here. I want my son. And, of course, people are very well-meaning. And so growing up in a culture of the supernatural lifestyle, you had many people who would come and would say, I had a dream, and I saw your kids. It's going to happen at this time. And, and very well-meaning. But hurtful because, one, there was never a time that I felt like someone truly, truly was hearing from God on our behalf. Every time someone would say that, nothing within me would click. But hurtful when it continued to not happen over and over and over. Yeah. And so I remember I was working in my basement. I would, I, we, we have a house that was unfinished at the time. And so I was working on transforming the basement into a usable space. And I was listening to different worship CDs and I turned on different messages. And I was listening to Chris Valentin one day and, and I, I'm working there and he's getting ready to preach. And he says, hang on, hang on, hang on. He said, I, I, I got to do this. He said, I don't like doing this. I don't enjoy doing this. He said, because... I, I think this is always a scary thing, a scary risk. He said, in fact, I tell my students, don't do this. But he said, God is telling me that I have to do this right now. He said, if you're in the room, I want you, and you are, are waiting to have children, you haven't been able to have kids, I want you to stand up. So now I'm listening, but I'm going, I'm, I'm not there, I'll just kind of see what's going on. And so he says, if you're in the room, I want you to stand up. He goes, wait a minute, if you're watching or if you're listening to this message, stop what you're doing. I stopped what I was doing. <laughs> And he said, the Lord is telling me to tell you that within the year, you will find yourselves pregnant, and you'll be ready to have a child. And 
Again, I've heard this many times, but I felt goosebumps go up and down my spine, and I can still get them today. And I began to cry, and I said, Lord, are you serious? Like, really? Lord, don't, don't tell me this if it's not real. It's been eight years. And I knew that the Lord was saying, listen. And I, I just had my moment. I put down what I was doing, and I just stopped, and I began to pray, and I began to worship. And upstairs in, our, uh, in the main area of our home, we had two bedrooms. And so we were using one as a bedroom, and the other I was using for my office. And I heard the Lord very clearly say, if you believe me, and turn that extra room into a nursery by faith. I said, okay. And so I, I continued doing what I was doing. I truly believe with all my heart that I had heard from the Lord. And I didn't want to tell anybody. Because even though I believed, I was a little scared. <laughs> but I knew what God had said. But I thought, you know, I'm going to wait and see if he will confirm that. If I keep my mouth shut and the Lord confirms it through someone else, that would be pretty cool. So I didn't tell Tennille. I didn't tell anybody. And that was in November of 2014, and it was a week later that we went down to my brother's church for Thanksgiving. And so, or went down to my brother's home, my brother pastors the church. And so we went there for Thanksgiving, and we celebrated together, and we stayed for, uh, for church that weekend. And so I'm sitting in the service, and my brother starts preaching his message, and he's talking about how important it is if God gives you a promise that you need to make room for that promise. And so he's going on, he's talking about all this stuff, and he says, for instance, if, if you're asking God for financial breakthrough, then make some room in your pockets. Give. And he starts naming off all these things. And the last thing he says, and if you're praying for a child, turn that extra room into a nursery. <laughs> uh, well, I've got a conversation to have. <laughs> and so I got in the car, and Tanil and I started making our way home from Vancouver, and in the car, I began to tell her what God had shared. And we got excited. And we thought, this is really happening. This is cool. And so we started talking about, well, what are we going to do for the nursery? What's it going to look like? How are we going to do this? We began planning it out. We began getting different things when we got home. And, and that, of course, was Thanksgiving. And so Christmas is coming up. So that's always exciting to talk about a baby around Christmas time. And, and we're just fired up. And about a week before Christmas, I'm cooking in my kitchen. And Tanil is in the other room. And she'd been having some pains and Nothing that we were too worried about. We thought, you know, maybe this is just, just she's having a bad day. But I'm cooking in the kitchen, and all of a sudden I hear her cry out from the living room, and I run into the living room, and Tanil is on the floor, writhing in pain. I said, what's going on? She goes, I don't know. And I said, well, get up. We're going to the hospital. And so we rush to the emergency room. We get into the emergency room, and they start doing all kinds of tests, trying to figure out what in the world is going on that would cause this. And so the doctor comes in after some initial tests, and he goes, well, it looks like he said, it looks like you've got a, a, a cyst that is ruptured uh, in her ovaries. And he said, it doesn't look like that big of a deal. This can be common. He said, so we're just going to watch it for a little bit, and then we'll probably just send her home and give her some pain medication. No fun, but, you know, it'll be okay. So we sat there, and we thought, well, this stinks. And, of course, I'm going, Lord, this is... This is weird. You know, what, what's going on? Um, but okay, maybe it's not that big of a deal. All right, so the doctor comes back in. Well, we're going to do a few more tests. Um, we're a little more concerned this time. Uh, we did notice that there is some bleeding in her stomach. So we said, okay. He said, but still, you know, it could be a little while, but probably we'll send her home. We're, you know, make some things, make, um, check on some things, make sure everything's okay. The next thing we know, the doctor comes in. Well, we're going to admit to, you know, to the hospital. Uh, we want to watch her overnight. So we get admitted into the hospital, and of course, I've got a promise on this side, and I've got something over here that I can do absolutely nothing about. I'm not a doctor. I don't have the foggiest idea what's happening with my wife. But I had a promise on this side, and all I could hear God saying was just, be still. Just be still. That's not really good when you want to control things. <laughs> it's not really what you want to hear when you're saying, but Lord, I want an answer. I want to know why my wife is going through this. I want to know why they're admitting her into the hospital. And at 3 a.m., one of the doctors came in and said, we're going to do emergency surgery. Uh, we want to get in there and find out what exactly is going on. And Tamil had never been in the hospital before. She never had surgery before. Thankfully, she was pretty drugged up at that point. And so <laughs> I signed some paperwork. And uh, they took her in at 6 a.m. that morning. 
And they brought her back out after an hour and a half or so, and I got to see her in the room, and I said to the nurse, what happened? And she said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> Be still. All right. So she sits in the room, and we wait, and the nurse comes in again. Hey, what happened? I don't know. Be still. Guys, I don't know if this is normal or not. You can probably tell me this is normal or not. <laughs> we waited all morning before we saw a doctor to tell us what exactly they had just done to my wife. <laughs> Finally, the doctor comes in, and he says, well, he said, we got in there, and he said, we discovered that Tennille had severe endometriosis. He said, not only that, one ovary was so damaged that we had to remove it. Uh, hang on. Lord, didn't you just tell me that I was going to be a dad within a year? What do you mean they just took out one of my wife's ovaries? Be still. The doctor said, do you have kids? No, we do not. Do you want kids? Yes, we do. Well, this is why you haven't been able to have kids. But I just reset her entire system. And there is absolutely no reason for you not to get pregnant within the next few months. Praise <laughs> God. <laughs> He looks at me, and I'm still, I'm, you know, I'm me. And he looks at me and he says, um, you know, a lot of people get concerned because of, you know, having only one ovary versus two. He said, let me be very clear. You have just as many chances of getting pregnant with one as you do. And of course, our minds are now blown. We're now freaking out. All of my be still is now turned into happy dance. And of course, can't do a happy dance at this point, but... We're feeling like, wow, God, you've done what you said you would do. But we weren't pregnant yet. So we, uh, we get her home. She starts recovering. We don't do all of that. Um, my screaming set is proof of what the rest of the story is. But I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> we, we start working on the nursery. And I developed carpal tunnel. How stupid is that? So I had to go get surgery, and I did that. So that put a hold on our, our uh, nursery work. But the first month goes by, of course, Neil had to recover. The first month goes by, we're trying now to have a child, and we aren't pregnant. Now, you've got to remember, the Lord told me that I would have a child in the coming year. That meant that at some point in 2015, 2014, excuse me, we need to have a baby. So, Lord, you've got until the end of 2014 to give us a baby. <laughs> January goes by, no baby. February goes by. No baby. March goes by. No baby. Any math people? <laughs> Lord, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, we're uh, kind of running on, uh, a little short on your time here. <laughs> and I remember driving down the road and going, okay, after everything we've been through, Lord, Lord, <laughs> you really think it's cool that we're not pregnant yet? <laughs> And all of a sudden, I had this incredible moment where the Lord once again said, are you going to trust me? And I said, you're the God who can birth a baby out of thin air. And when you make a promise, you're going to keep that promise. So I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'm going to trust that you're going to do what you need to do. And he said, hey, how about that nursery? See, my hands, I had had surgery. But by March, I was feeling pretty good. It's time to get that nursery done. So I went home and we finished the nursery. I went to the store one day about a week after the nursery was done. And I finished my shopping and I get into the car and Tenille calls. And she says, Sean, uh, I think you need to go get a pregnancy test. <laughs> I said, you're kidding, right? And she goes, no, but don't get your hopes up. I said, too late. And I ran home. <laughs> I had to run back and get the car later and bring that home. Uh, <laughs> we got a pregnancy test, and it showed up positive that night. But you know what our due date was? January 3rd of 2015. 
That's not 2014. You said 2014, Lord. You said within a year. But that's your due date. Okay, whatever. December 8th, Tennille says, Sean, my water broke. <laughs> and on December 9th of 2014, we had a baby. Just a little early. But we had the baby that God had promised. Sometimes you just got to be still and know that he is God. Amen. There are a lot of battles in my life that I've tried to take control of. Anybody? No, nobody else is like, I'm the only one. <laughs> Many times when we're at the end of our rope, and we've prayed for so long, we've trusted for so long, or maybe we haven't prayed, but we've gone through the motions, and the thing that we say is, well, I've done everything I can do, all we can do now is pray. Is that an awesome statement? You love that statement? What we're really trying to communicate is, I no longer know how to control this situation, so my last resort will be prayer, until I can think of a way to control this situation. Hezekiah is a king that we're going to talk about today, and I love Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of those kings that stands in direct opposition to Israel's first king, Saul, in a lot of ways. Saul who operated in so much fear that Saul tried to control just about everything that he encountered in every situation that he faced. When Samuel wasn't there to offer the sacrifice, what did Saul do? Make my own sacrifice. When God told Saul to kill the Agagites, what did Saul do? He said, I got a better idea. Let's spare King Agag. And he had to face the consequences. When he knew that the Spirit of God was no longer with him, what did he do? He goes and consults the witch of Endor and ends up placing his destiny into the hands of demons. So Hezekiah is a guy that I really like. And it's a guy whose story we're going to look at today because he understood what it meant to let go of control and to trust God in the midst of bad situations. So I want you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 19. As you go there, say this with me. The Word of God, Word of God is my catalyst, is my catalyst to personal reformation, to personal reformation and, total and total transformation. As it invades my heart, it heart, permeates my soul, I carry revival. I release the kingdom. And I walk in my identity as a child of God. This is what it says in 2 Kings chapter 19, starting with verse 14, then we're going to skip down. But it says in verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hands so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Skip down to verse 32. It says this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. That's what it says in verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. When the people got up the next morning. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. See, Hezekiah understood that he was completely and totally incapable of doing anything in his power to overcome the king of Assyria. He knew that in his own power, he and his people were toast. They were done. And we have to understand that in our lives, we've got to be careful that we don't hold on to double standards when it comes to our trust 
in God's ability to give us victory in the battles that come against us. We can't treat prayer as if it's a last resort and then repeat good old Christian cliches like, well, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. You ever use that one? The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. If prayer is my last resort, then it stands to reason that I don't believe that the safest place to be is the center of God's will. Because if I truly understood that and believed that, then prayer would be my only resort. We've got to understand that being in the center of God's will is actually incredibly dangerous. Being in the center of God's will is one of the scariest places that you can be sometimes. Because you're stepping out and you're taking risks and you're believing that the God who called you is going to provide everything that you need in order to accomplish that which he has called you to. And it doesn't always look like it's going to work out the way you want it to work out. I'll never forget a couple years ago, I was standing at the gas station, and I'm getting ready to pump gas, and I hear Holy Spirit say very clearly, do you need me to do that with you? I said, what? Well, yeah, do you need my help with that? Uh, no? <laughs> oh. Sean, how much of your life do you need my help with? See, it's really easy to get safe. I don't need Holy Spirit's help to pump gas. But you put me in a rough situation. I guarantee you, I need Holy Spirit. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't want us to think that we are required to put ourselves in dangerous situations in order to have the help of Holy Spirit. But what we do need to understand is that there are Christians around the world who at this very moment are being tortured and killed because they refuse to back down from their faith in Christ. They're not safe. But are they in the center of God's will? I don't believe that their torture and their death is God's will. I don't believe that. But the amazing truth is that regardless of whether or not they live or die, they've placed their hope in Christ as their only option. Not their last option. Their only option. A hundred years ago, when missionaries began to leave this country to take the gospel to faraway lands, they would get a coffin. Not a suitcase. They'd get a coffin. And they would pack their coffin with all of their earthly goods, and they would ship it to the land that they were going to, because they realized that they were probably going to give their life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When's the last time you packed your coffin? Our mindset is not one that we can always appreciate that kind of risk. But we have to learn to pray honest prayers. To say, Lord, I'm completely lost in what I need to do in this moment. So prayer is not going to be my last option. It's going to be my only option. The king of Syria was pretty thorough in his strategy against Hezekiah. He really knew what he was doing when he comes against him. In fact, you can compare it to the way the enemy many times comes against us even today. And I want to look at that quickly. The first thing is, is questioning. He brought about questioning. In 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, verse 19, one chapter before this, it says, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says, on what are you basing this great confidence of yours? He looks at them and he says, listen, pay attention to me because I'm big and you're little. So what are you basing your confidence in? Who have you put your trust in? He's attempting to draw them to conclusions that they would never come to under normal circumstances. Think about that. For instance, we would never question God's ability to heal our child of cancer until our child has cancer. We would never question God's ability to meet every need until we have a need. So whenever you're facing something, my faith for you is incredible because I'm not the one who's going through it. But when you're, when I'm going through something, that's when the enemy comes and says, in what are you placing this great confidence of yours? And we begin questioning everything we know because the threat is directly in front of us. And then there's bargaining. Sounds like I'm talking about the grief process. But then there's bargaining. He says this in, in 2 Kings chapter 18 as well. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. 
Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. This is the enemy talking. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. It sounds really good. Choose life. Choose, choose life, not death. This is your enemy that is talking. There are many forms of it that the enemy comes to us in to try and bargain when we're facing a battle. And then that causes us to begin bargaining. Have you ever bargained with God? God, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you, if you give me children, I'll do this. Or, or God, if you, if you take this temptation away, I'll do this. Or God, if you would just help me pay this debt, then I'll do this. I heard a, a story, there was a, a comedian that was talking one day, and he said that he got thrown in jail. And when he got thrown in jail, he uh, began to pray. He said, Lord, if you just get me out of this, I will go to church every single Sunday. I'll stop swearing. I'll stop drinking. I'll stop smoking. I'll stop doing all the horrible things that I've ever done. God, if you just get me out of this. And at that moment, the, the, the warden came and said, Sir, your mother's here, and she's bailed you out. And he said, Dear Lord, thanks anyway. <laughs> We have to believe that God is good. We've got to believe that God is good. And because He is good, because He loves us, He is going to help us. Not because of what we have to offer. We had nothing to offer in the first place. He loves us and He's for us. And if He's going to do anything for us, it's based on His goodness and it's based on His love. He's the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need anything that you have to offer. He does what He does because of His great love. When we knew that our sin was separating us from Him, it wasn't something that you and I could do to fix that. It was His own Son that became sin on our behalf. There's no bargaining to be done with God. Jesus is the only bargaining chip that we will ever need. And God has already signed and dated the contract. So don't waste your time trying to bargain a deal that has already been made. The third thing that happens is Sennacherib comes to them with circumstantial evidence. He says this in 2 Kings 18.34. He says, where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim, Hena and, and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Number one, he was pretty stupid. Number two, it had worked with these other countries. And he had reason to believe that this God, whoever he was of Judah, was not going to be able to save them from his hand. You see, the enemy's goal is to disprove what God is doing in the spiritual by proving what's already taken place in the physical. You ever think about that? Our spiritual reality is our greatest reality, right? But we also live in a physical body. So many times when we experience things physically, it causes us to question things spiritually. You're believing God for a miracle over cancer, but your aunt died five years ago. You want to walk in power and authority, but the last time you took a risk, you ended up looking stupid. You want to uh, trust your pastors or your small group leaders with something that you're facing, but your last pastor let you down. It's amazing how easy it is to forget the multiple victories that we have walked in and the multiple ex victories that we have experienced when the enemy begins to magnify just a few failures. When God's calling us to stand still, there's going to be a point where you have to tell the enemy to shut up. You have to pay attention to Hezekiah's response just prior to their victory. Because this is what happens. He doesn't question God, but he submits God's word. In 2 Kings 19, it says, When Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says, Don't be afraid of what you've heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. That's God's promise in the midst of King Sennacherib's. And what do you place this great confidence in? You see, in this, in this time period, we had a group of people who couldn't rely on indwelling Holy Spirit, 
right? They had to listen to the word of the Lord from a prophet, from a godly person, someone who God had chosen. And while it's important to have people who are around you that will speak into your life, I want to be surrounded by people who hear from the Lord, I have to understand that I have a better promise than Hezekiah. And so the promise is that I have Holy Spirit living inside of me who is willing and more than able to give me a word that I'm able to stand on. Amen. So in the midst of the battle, when God is calling you to stand still, it's important to say, Lord, what is the word that you're giving me to stand on? If you're calling me to stand still, what am I standing on? Hezekiah doesn't bargain, but he submits to God's sovereignty. In 2 Kings 19, verse 15, it says, And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. Whoever turned on the air, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Hezekiah had no need to give in to the bargaining that Sinatra was offering. He didn't have to. Nor did he see any reason to bargain with God himself. Instead, Hezekiah declared the sovereignty of God over the matter. He didn't have to bargain for favor because he already had favor. Guys, we have favor. We have more favor than Hezekiah had. Because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, within us. And if that's true, then you and I are God's highly favored one. Because Jesus is God's highly favored one. In our battles, we can stand in sovereignty of God. And in the knowledge that He is greater than any opposition that we face. There's no threat that's worthy of our fear or anxiety because there's no threat that's worthy of his fear or anxiety. And if God's not afraid, then we don't need to be afraid. Amen. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. And finally, he lays the circumstantial evidence before the Lord. Because there was circumstantial evidence. There was reason to be scared of the king of Syria. But it says in 2 Kings 19 verse 17, it is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. They were not gods, but only wooden stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. We don't have to ignore evidence. We don't have to look at things and pre pretend as if they don't exist. Greg, you face things that exist every day, but you believe in a God who is bigger than those things. But it doesn't mean that we don't address them. How horrible would it be if you went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you know, you've got cancer, but we're not going to do anything about it. It's there, but, you know, just don't worry. No, 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 no. We can address the things that are truly happening. The important thing is that Hezekiah understood that what God was capable of doing in the spiritual was greater than anything that was taking place the physical. What he could see with his physical eyes was daunting and worth realizing, but what he could see with his spiritual eyes was greater. He understood that the gods who would help Sinatra were gods that were made of wood and stone, made by human hands. But the God that Hezekiah served was the everlasting God. It's your spiritual eyes that will allow you to see what God is capable of doing in the future and to keep your eyes on that. It's your spiritual eyes that will help you focus on what to believe and who to believe. Remember when Elisha was talking with his servant Gehazi? And Gehazi was scared out of his mind because of what they were facing. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open my servant's eyes. And it says, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Don't you wish God would just open up our spiritual eyes sometimes? Hezekiah committed his heart to listen and to stand on the word of the Lord, to submit to the sovereignty of God, and to place his trust in the promises of God and not the evidence of man. It was in that moment that he was able to be still and trust that God would do his part. There was nothing left for Hezekiah to do but to go to sleep. There was nothing left for Hezekiah to do but to go to sleep. In, in times of battle, it can be really hard to sleep, huh? That's true. 
when you're facing something, I, I've been there. I've faced things in front of me that I thought, there's no way I'm going to be safe tonight. But there's something powerful that happens when we stop questioning, when we stop arguing, when we stop looking at the circumstantial evidence. There's a peace that comes to where we rest, where we sleep. And when we wake up the next morning, there are 185,000 of your enemies dead on the battlefield. The writer of Psalms 46 says it like this. Psalm 46.10 says, He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In the New Testament, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 6, Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, I mentioned before the old Christian cliche that the safest place to be is in the center of the will of God. And I, I propose this morning that we change our understanding. That we realize that in the place of greatest danger, we are in the center of Christ, who is in the center of God, who has centered His Holy Spirit within us. Can I show you this real quick before we, before we, we pray? Stephen, come help me real quick. Stephen, come here. Gilbert, come here. Joe, come here. Okay, Gilbert's God. <laughs> Say, nice to meet you. <laughs> okay? All right. Actually, Dave, I need one more person, okay? So, actually, this will look cooler if I do this. We're going to make you God, Joe. Come here. Okay, so sorry. Gilbert's Jesus, okay? All right. Okay. Okay, here is, here's God. Okay, Jesus, here's Jesus. Jesus, come this way. Stand in front of Joe. Jesus is in God. Okay? Now let's say Stephen is you. Come here, Stephen. Stephen is everybody. Stephen's everybody. Stephen, come here. Stephen, you've allowed Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, so you are in Christ. Okay? David, come here. You're Holy Spirit. This is going to make you a good Holy Spirit. This is a good Holy Spirit. All right. You are in Stephen. Okay? It's a Stephen sandwich. Stephen? <laughs> How hard is it right now to just stand still? Because you are in Christ. That was the wrong answer, by the way. That's okay. All right. Uh, you are in Christ. Christ is in God. The Holy Spirit is in you. Are you scared of anything right now? No. No. This is a good place to be. And this is what it looks like for us as the people of God. We are in Christ, who is in God. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit is within us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you stand with me this morning and be close? <laughs> Father, we worship you for who you are. Because you are the God of all gods. And every other God is nothing more than a God that's been fashioned out of wood and stone. Yes. Gods that will fall and will break and have nothing to offer us. But you are the everlasting God. And our hope is steadfast because you are steadfast. Our promises are faithful because you are faithful. Jesus, you are the reason that we can hope. Because you've given us the ability to see God. Because we've seen you. We've seen the Father. And Holy Spirit, we can stand in faith. We can stand in strength. We can walk in power. Because you've come to live within us. <coughs> and so I pray peace over every single person in this room. I declare the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard every heart and every mind in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Father, that in this place right now, that every battle that might be raging around us would hear peace be still. And that you would speak to our hearts this morning to be still. Because you are unchanging. You are unmoving. And we are grounded. We are centered within you as our hope. We love you today. Let every person that's in this room walk away from this room with peace. Be still in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen.